welcome back to Conversation. My name's Lauren. And I'm Taylor. Welcome back. <laughs> so, who do we have on the show today, Lauren? Today we are talking to Dr. Noah Painter Davis. Mm hmm. And he's an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico. He received his PhD in sociology and demography from Pennsylvania State University. His research interests include crime, law, and social control, race and ethnicity, specifically race and ethnic differences in crime and punishment, demography and crime, courts and sentencing, and quantitative methods. Dr. Painter Davis presented at a panel that I was on last year, and we know after his presentation, we had to have him come on. Um, he did such a great job, so we like we, he has to come on the show. Mm -hmm. And luckily, he agreed, so we're very happy to have him today. Yes, so this is going to be sort of a special addition to our series on race and crime. And he also discusses drug sentencing and racial disparities. So check it out, and also be sure to follow us on Twitter, yep. at Crimeversation. Enjoy! And with that introduction, welcome Dr. Painter Davis. Hello. Hello, thank you for Hi. being here. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Yes. yes. So today we're going to be discussing three presentations on the opioid epidemic. And actually, when we, you and I were both on a panel together, and I heard you speak about this, and I was like, we have to have him on the episode. So we are very excited to have you today. And so today we're going to be discussing, the first one we'll start with, is the hidden windows of discretion and disparity racial disparities in drug sentencing in Pennsylvania. And you presented this in collaboration with Jeff Almer, who we just had on a couple hours ago. So we had his part of this as well. <laughs> um, so would you like to kind of introduce this study for us a little bit and discuss kind of, you know, how this project got started? Okay, I'll talk about how this project got started and how it's evolved because it's, it's changed direction a lot since I presented it at ASC in 2018. Um, well, I think I'll just get into it. The, the main thing is that the study starts looking at sentencing guidelines and how they affect sentencing. Mm -hmm. So for the listeners out, out there, sentencing guidelines help structure judicial decision-making by giving sentencing recommendations based on the offender's offense severity and their criminal history. It's a way of uh, minimizing judicial dis discretion and, uh, as a result, minimizing disparities in sentencing. Mm -hmm. And re research has generally shown that sentencing guidelines are good at reduce at, are effective at reducing sentencing disparities. Mm -hmm. um, however, one way that disparities are reintroduced into the sentencing process and sentencing guideline states are through something called departures. Mm -hmm. And when a judge a departure is when the judge sentences outside of the guideline recommendation. And when they sentence outside of the guideline recommendation, they have to give a reason for their departure. Mm -hmm. And and those sentences often can be appealed. They can be appealed by the defense. Mm -hmm. So that's a way that disparities have been reintroduced into sentencing guidelines because research has shown that blacks and Latinos are more likely than whites to receive upward departures, which are sentences that are harsher than the guidelines, and they're less likely to receive downward departures, mm -hmm. which are sentences that are more lenient than the guidelines recommend. So sentencing guidelines, this is a pretty complicated study, so it's going to take me a while to explain. <laughs> sentencing guidelines were created to uh, make sentences more uniform and, mm -hmm. and to reduce disparity. However, however, over the past three decades, and especially over the past decade, there's been an increased uh, goal of sentencing commissions to make sentences more effective. Mm -hmm to uh, reduce the cost of sentences, to reduce recidivism, to encourage rehabilitation. And as a, as a part of that process, sentencing guideline systems have started incorporating intermediate punishments into their sentencing guidelines. Intermediate punishments are programs that use community service, rehabilitation programs, um, a lot of community-oriented programs as alternatives to incarceration. So on one hand, the sentencing guidelines try to make sentencing more uniform by getting rid of judicial discretion. At the same time, sentencing guidelines are starting to incorporate these intermediate punishments into the guidelines to make sentences more effective. Well, there's been a big struggle within sentencing guidelines about how to balance these goals of wanting to reduce disparity with wanting to craft effective sentences. And the big problem here is when you want to craft effective sentences, you often have to consider factors that are not built into the guidelines. So 
factors other than offense severity in criminal history, such as factors associated with a person's rehabilitative potential. And oftentimes, factors that are associated with rehabilitative potential have to do with resources. It could be socioeconomic resources. It could also be um, social ties in the community, things that can help you uh, uh, in the rehabilitation process. But when you consider those factors, sometimes disparity is entered back into the process because racial minorities tend to have less of these resources. Mm -hmm. So in our study, we focusing on judicial decisions to conform to the guidelines or to, to, or to depart, and how the presence of alternative sanctions influences this process. Mm -hmm. And in Pennsylvania, as several other states, the guidelines have something called zones of discretion, where a judge can sentence a defendant to an incarceration sentence or to a treatment-focused sentence mm -hmm. without departing from the guidelines. Mm -hmm. So again, now judges can... Now, in many states, judges can conform to the guidelines and sentence somebody to a rehabilitative sentence without having to depart. Yes. So in the past, disparities were usually entered into the process when judges would depart from the guidelines to sentence the sentence either harsher or more leniently than the sentence recommendation. Mm -hmm. Now they can sentence people to, to a variety of punishments within the guidelines without departing. Mm -hmm. What this means and what Jeff and I studied is What's happening in those guideline-conforming cells? Are judges sentencing uh, whites and blacks and Latinos similarly to one another, or is there disparity when judges are conforming to the guidelines? Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is that judges are more likely to sentence white defendants to rehabilitative intermediate punishments than Latino or black defendants as both guideline-conforming sentences, sentences that conform to the guideline recommendation, and as departures from the guidelines. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing more punishment for black and Latino defendants versus more rehabilitation for white defendants, which is pretty consistent with prior literature. Yes, mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the novel part is that it's being built into the guidelines now. Which so. is very interesting, especially for Pennsylvania sentencing guidelines. And you said that's pretty consistent with the other states that have sentencing guidelines? Yes, a number of other states have these things called zones of discretion where you can and to choose a variety of sentences to sentence somebody without departing from the guidelines. And Pennsylvania is one of those states. North Carolina, Ohio, and I think even the federal government has some zones of discretion in their guidelines. Okay. Hmm. And so from your article, um, for our listeners, you mentioned drug laws and how they're problematic, and specifically a couple, like, two main ways that they're problematic. Can you explain for our listeners the way that the, these drug laws can be problematic for defendants? Well, I'll talk about, uh, first, they're problematic in their application. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at research, it shows that um, drug laws are often applied inequitably across racial ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. In particular, in the area of criminal sentencing, research has shown that racial disparities in sentencing are the strongest for drug offenders. So they're the most pronounced when studying drug offenses. So mm -hmm. they're problematic in their application. And then second, they're problematic in their construction in that many view drug laws, including scholars and many court actors, is unfair um, because their severity is often not viewed as commensurate to the actual harm caused or the risk posed by the offender, as with violent offenses, or rather driven more by factors associated with fear and politics. Mm -hmm. And I guess another way that they're problematic in their construction now is that uh, there's a lot of treatment-oriented sentences that are being adopted by the sentencing, by different sentencing guideline systems they're not equally available to all defendants. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not applied equally to all defendants. Can I take you back for a second? So I want to talk about the sentencing guidelines again. It seems to me like before they made this change, if a judge sentenced outside of the guidelines, then there was this departure that would take place. And mm -hmm. if somebody was sentenced to something that was too harsh, then the defense would have an opportunity to, you know, argue against that, right? But with this new way where they have a variety of options, it almost seems like that's actually going to be more difficult for the defense to be able to come back and argue with a sentence. Is that correct, do you think? Yes, that is correct. I would also okay. say that though, though uh, the, these departures are subject to appeal, they're hardly ever appealed. I guess the big thing is, huh. is they kind of, they, the departures actually kind of 
act as a signal to policymakers about whether judges agree or disagree with the laws that are on the books. Oh, that's and interesting. Okay. So when they when a judge departs, that's kind of a signal that they don't agree with the law. Mm-hmm. And so the problem here is that maybe disparity might be more hidden now because it doesn't require a departure. To in, departure is not the vehicle that's going to lead to disparity anymore. People can receive, and a uh, white defendant could receive a treatment-based sentence. A black defendant convicted of the same crime could receive an incarceration-based sentence, and it would both look like guideline-conforming sentences. Mm-hmm. So it's more of a veiled uh, discretionary tool, kind of. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, and just ch- more challenging for researchers. You kind of, I'm assuming, you kind of have to wade through their decision making to kind of say what is or is not, you know, what used to be called as uh, over, kind of overruling the sentencing guidelines. Yes, it's been it's been uh, complicated. It's under I revise and resubmit all um, for the second time, and oh, wow. it's been a, a big difficulty has been how to model this um, yeah. in the best way because it hasn't really been looked at before. Rodney Egan and some of his colleagues did it in Washington, where they looked at how uh, the imposition of intermediate punishments influenced departures from the guidelines. Mm -hmm. But it's a very different system than Pennsylvania. So So we can get to how you did model this for this paper and the three main questions you asked. We kind of explained to our listeners kind of the model you guys used for this. That has changed over time, but I guess... The, the primary way we're looking at it now is we're overall looking at, one, whether the judge departed from the guidelines mm-hmm. and whether it was an upward departure or a downward departure, mm-hmm. and then looking at whether those findings change when we specify the type of sentence that was given. So, for instance, in Pennsylvania, you can receive an upward departure, a downward departure, or a standard guideline-conforming sentence. Mm-hmm. However... Once you disaggregate it by sentence type, you can receive a downward departure involving an intermediate rehabilitative punishment. You can receive a standard sentence involving an intermediate punishment, or you can receive an upward departure involving an intermediate punishment. You can also receive all those options with incarceration. So it gets really complicated. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And so what did you expect to find in this paper? We expect to find that a lot of the disadvantages for racial minorities would now be found within the guideline conforming range. Mm -hmm. So in the past, racial disparities were introduced primarily by departures from the guidelines. Now disparities are actually occurring as standard guideline conforming sentences. Mm -hmm. So judges are following the law, uh, following the recommendations of the guidelines, but still doing so in ways that... um, disadvantage racial ethnic minorities. Hmm. Okay. And for our listeners, what did you find? Well, we found that racial disparities, you know, uh, blacks and Latinos were less likely to receive these rehabilitative sentences as either guideline-conforming sentences or as um, departures from the guidelines. And we also found some gender dynamics consistent with prior research. The racial disparities were found primarily for men. They were um, observed among women, but to a, they were less uh, less severe. The disparities were less severe for women. Okay, very interesting. Second is court communities and racial disparities in drug sentencing, the role of social capital. And this was in collaboration with Ulmer, Sevensmeyer, and Feldmeyer. So this is a pretty packed paper. I was pretty excited to read about this. Um, kind of what got you guys started in this paper? I guess what primarily got us started in this paper is uh, there's been a lot of research on neighborhoods and their ability to uh, control crime through community social organization. Um, and a fundamental part of this community social organization is social capital, which can be thought of as the overall level of social trust and the degree of engagement with community-oriented activities and organizations. So communities that tend to have more social capital tend to have less crime. Mm-hmm. Well, this concept of social capital hasn't been applied much in the sentencing literature. Correct. So we, we wanted to see, uh, does the presence of social capital in a community impact a judge's sentencing decisions? Will a judge be more likely to grant a defendant a community-based sentence in a community that has more social and community resources to help the defendant? Mm-hmm. 
Kind of getting at the third part of focal concerns, like what are the restrictions of the actual community? Like how much can they handle a little bit in dealing with defendants? Exactly. Looking at uh, the, the practical constraints and consequences of the community. Does the community have enough treatment resources? Mm-hmm. Um, there's also, it, does the, is the defendant's social network going to be strong enough to support them through um, a process of rehabilitation? Mm-hmm. And so what were the two main questions of this paper where you guys were seeking to answer? Uh, our two questions were, how do, how do markers of community social capital influence the use of alternative sanctions, such as the use of community service and also of rehabilitation-focused programs, such as drug treatment programs? Mm-hmm. And our second question is, how does community social capital influence racial disparities in the imposition of these sanctions? Mm-hmm. And what did you guys expect to find? Um, we expected to find that localities, court communities with higher levels of social capital would be more likely to use alternative sanctions. And we felt uh, this was the case for a variety of reasons. If a community uh, community has more social capital, they'll probably have a better infrastructure and networks in order to support these alternative sanctions in a way that would be successful and that judges would feel comfortable sentencing defendants in those localities to these sentences. Mm -hmm. Um, For community social capital and how it would influence racial disparities, we had some competing hypotheses there, but uh, in the end we predicted that communities with higher levels of social capital would lead to greater racial disparities in the imposition of alternative sanctions, in part because these social capital resources may be more available to white defendants than than for ethno-racial minorities, and because court actors may sense this, they may be more likely to sentence white defendants to these community-based sanctions, but less likely to sentence uh, racial minorities to these sanctions. Very good. And so you also are using sentencing data for this paper, and cases were limited to drug offenses and most serious offenses, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Do you mind going over the controls, Ed, that everyone used in this paper? I, I haven't worked on this paper in a while. i got to get back to it, but the, some of the main <laughs> okay. things were that we, we controlled for... Um, First, the presence of treatment-based resources in the community, Mm -hmm. such as the presence of drug treatment programs and the funding for those programs. Mm -hmm. We also controlled for the amount of crime, drug-related crime in those areas Mm -hmm. at the county level. And then our main variable was a social capital index. It's based on a number of variables in the community, such as the number of nonprofit organizations in the community and other markers of community participation. Mm -hmm. And we also controlled for at the defendant level their criminal history, um, offense severity, whether they were convicted via trial or plea. And we use multi-level modeling uh, to look at both the dis- effects of defendant level characteristics and community characteristics on sentencing, and also to do inter- interaction, cross-level interactions between the defendant's characteristics and the community characteristics. Yeah, the interactions were very, very interesting. I really enjoyed reading about that, just because you did kind of take the take it the step further to evaluate those. So you limited it to drug offenses and also most serious offenses. Was there a particular mm-hmm. reason that you didn't do any minor offenses? I focused on drug offenses, for one, because I wanted to, to because a lot of the alternative sanctions are dedicated to people who have, who are, either drug addicted or have committed drug crimes. That's one of the reasons I looked at drug offenses. And also because I'm, I'm doing some broader work on the opioid epidemic and how different communities are responding. And so I wanted to key in on the drug offenses and perhaps down the road look at how communities are reacting to different types of drug offenders. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then the, the most serious offenders? So, you know, a defendant can be con- convicted of a variety of crimes, and just a common way of simplifying the analysis in the sentencing literature, specifically in Pennsylvania, is to to limit the analysis to the most serious offense, because that's the offense that is the most relevant for the sentencing decision. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. That's a a great reason. Thank you. And so what did you find in this article? Well, I, I will say all these findings are tentative, but we did find, again, that racial ethnic minorities were less likely than whites to receive these alternative sanctions. So they were more likely to receive incarceration-based sentences. Blacks and Latinos are more likely to receive incarceration-based sentences, while whites were more likely to receive alternative sanctions, such as treatment-based approaches. And we also found that, as expected, 
that in communities with higher levels of social capital, alternative sanctions were more likely to be used. Mm -hmm. And then last, we found that in communities that have higher levels of social capital, there is some evidence that racial disparities are higher in those communities. So what implications do you see from this line of research? So showing that, you know, there are problems in these neighborhoods in terms of their sentencing, what implications do you see coming from this? I've actually not com- not, not completely thought this out, but okay. <laughs> one of the reasons why I think one of the biggest, there's been a movement to using these diversion diversionary sentences, these alternative sanctions, mm-hmm. and one of the biggest things and concerns in the research community is increasing accessibility to minority communities. Yes. So that would be the primary implication. So perhaps court actors are more likely to give whites these sentences because these these options are more available to white defendants. Mm-hmm. But if they were more available throughout the community, including to minority communities, perhaps court actors would be more, the sentences would be less disparate. Mm-hmm. Can you repeat what the relationship was between community social capital and racial disparities? Um, it was that communities with hi- in communities with higher levels of social capital, gaps in sentencing between blacks, whites, and Latinos were the greatest in those communities. Interesting. So there was more racial disparities okay. in communities that had more social capital. So it's like the social capital was was benefiting white defendants, but wasn't benefiting minority defendants. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Okay, mm-hmm. thank you. Very good. Unfortunately, what we expect to find mm-hmm. <laughs> in yes. this line of research. So the third, mm-hmm. institutional response to crisis, a longitudinal assessment of the relationship between opioid deaths and sentencing outcomes for drug defendants in Pennsylvania. And as you mentioned, you are interested in like looking at opioid deaths and use. Um, so I was just excited to read this, knowing that you kind of wanted to go into that line of research a little bit more. So what kind of got you guys started in this paper? Um. I guess the main question here was how do courts respond during times of crisis? Mm -hmm. And particularly in terms of the opioid epidemic, it's interesting because the opioid epidemic is affecting a wide, a wider swath of society than than prior drug epidemics. It's Mm -hmm. affecting all racial ethnic groups. It's affecting uh, people from a variety of socioeconomic statuses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, kind of a question here is. How are people responding to the opioid epidemic when it's affecting people who are better off? Sure. Do you feel that's a part of the reason that the opioid epidemic has received so much attention in the news? Is because of the like more awareness, more so because of the people who are affected by it? Yes, to a certain extent, definitely. That it's just affecting a broader, broader swath of society, including people with more political power and more resources, and it's. It's, you know, I think politicians know that drug laws in the past have generally been ineffective and overly punitive, but this has, uh, this has added gro- growing steam to change drug laws and the, mm-hmm. fa- the fact that it's affecting people who have more power. Mm-hmm. And so what were the questions you sought out to answer in this paper? For one, there, even before the opioid epidemic, we have seen drug laws. Um, the opioid epidemic pretty much started in 1999, but it's gotten worse over the past decade. We've seen drug laws become more lenient over the past two decades. However, we wanted to see whether the application of laws was becoming more lenient during this opioid crisis. So on one hand, you might expect that people would punish offenders more harshly during an epidemic. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's reasons to expect that uh, punishment may become more lenient Mm -hmm. during the epidemic. And second, we wanted to know how is the opioid epidemic affected the sentencing of different types of drug offenders, Mm -hmm. from drug users to people who are uh, selling the drugs that are causing the epidemic. Mm -hmm. And then third, we wanted to know how has the epidemic impacted racial disparities in drug sentencing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious if you're, if you have any... uh, desire to start studying what we're seeing in the courts right now with the, kind of the families who are involved in this epidemic. Do you have any desire to kind of follow the court cases with them or more so just with uh, offenders? Oh, no, that'd be, it's a great question to study the application of drug laws across different types of drug offenders from the street offender mm-hmm. to the offender who is a doctor to the offender who is an organization. That's a great idea. And I, I, I 
do say some articles every now and then when I see them about organizations and their sentencing practices. So that is something I want to do down the line. Yeah, I would, I would just like how, to see criminologists do it. You know what I mean? For us to be mm-hmm. kind of the ones to evaluate what's happening with pharma right now. Yes, that's a really important question. So back to the article, sorry. Um, What did you expect to find in this paper? Wow, okay, let me think about this. (laughs) Now, we we expected it to be complex and also, uh, well, I'll lay out my expectations because sometimes those change depending on what you find. (laughs) But uh, the epidemic, we actually thought that over time the epidemic would lead to lighter sentencing, Mm -hmm. more lenient sentencing of certain types of offenders, but harsher sentencing of other types of offenders, or drug-addicted offenders. We would Mm -hmm. see more leniency over time as as courts move towards treatment-based approaches, Mm -hmm. but for, and even for people who are doing drugs to support their habit, perhaps Mm -hmm. more lenient sentences. But for big drug dealers, we expect to find harsher sentences over time. What did you end up finding? (laughs) A lot of these findings are as what you would expect, but we found that uh, as the opioid epidemic increased, it has led to, and we did this monthly, so we mm-hmm. looked at how monthly changes in overdose rates to county level impacted sentences in the county. Mm-hmm. And we found that increases in the opioid epidemic, so increase in drug overdose deaths, has overall led to a decrease in sentence severity. So as the opioid epidemic has gotten worse, sentencing of drug offenders has gotten more lenient. Some some of the interesting findings, and we're still in our preliminary stages here, is that sentences have have decreased more for for dangerous drug dealers than for low level offenders. So that was unexpected. Okay. We need to dig more into that. Okay. What implications do you see coming off of this? Because it has pretty interesting findings. So what implications do you see coming from this? Well, the, the third finding out, and I'll talk about the implications, is that we've actually found that there's been a narrowing of racial disparities in sentencing as the opioid epidemic has increased. So we didn't expect this either. Implications for the literature, you know, I think the primary implication would be how do courts respond in times in times of crises, mm-hmm. and we're still digging through that. I don't know uh, the broader implications, but the, the main the main focus of this presentation which is at its very early stages, is kind of bringing in the role of time. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's been a lot of focus on context in terms of community characteristics. We want to start thinking about time and and what's happening across the community during time periods as affecting court actor Mm decision-making. And circling back to your results, what was found specifically in terms of the racial disparities? We found that actually a lot of people would expect that, you know, these treatment-based approaches, which we're seeing the use of, of more, they're going to be applied more to, to whites than to Latinos or blacks, and that perhaps that would uh, continue throughout the epidemic. We're actually finding that disparities are decreasing during the epidemic, that that blacks, whites, and Latinos are starting to be treated more like one another as the epidemic has become worse. Mm-hmm. Okay, very interesting. And, and why do you think that is? Yeah. What do you think is going on there? Over the past 20 years, there's been increased recognition that the war on drugs um, is ineffective. And so the system has started cleaning up inefficiencies, sentencing lower-level drug offenders to sentences that are more reasonable. Well, perhaps when the system started cleaning up those inefficiencies, it started by cleaning up those inefficiencies for low-level offenders and for white offenders. However, perhaps now the system's starting to treat Latinos and, and uh Latinos and black defendants with more reasonable sentences, and that's cleaning up other inefficiencies in the system, while at the same time is which which is contributing to these narrowing of disparities. So the system has been overly punitive to drug offenders, um, overly punitive towards black and Latino offenders. Well, perhaps the system is starting to clean up inefficiencies in cost and just bad bad practices mm-hmm. by sentencing these groups who have been uh, historically punished more harshly to more equitable sentences. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So they're just kind of evening out, you think? I I think I need to uh, do do a lot more analyses of this, but uh, the bottom line is I think that there is still disparity in the system. Um, Blacks and Latinos are still sentenced harsher than whites. Mm -hmm. It's just narrowing, and I think it might be because Blacks and Latinos are being sentenced less harshly than they did in the past. Perhaps not as much of a change for whites, but black folks okay. are being sentenced less harshly. Okay. What are you presenting at ASC? Are you presenting the further findings from this? 
Um, actually, at ASC, so I'm at the University of New Mexico now and yes. starting to get into the sentencing data here. And I've actually collected, uh, with help from undergraduate researchers, looking at the effect of skin tone and oh, other good. physical features on punishment outcomes. And, you know, uh, Brian Johnson and Ryan King, they studied these dynamics in Minnesota with a sample of black and white descendants. Our extension here is that we're going to be bringing in Latino descendants and American Indian descendants. So we're going to be looking at four different racial groups. Very good. That, so in a data set that we've been looking at here in Florida, they actually have complexion on there. So I think like little things like that taking it a step further in terms of race ethnicity. So I'm very excited to see what you all present on in terms of skin tones and skin color. That'll be very fascinating. Yes, very, very excited about getting into the data. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I was just wondering, how long have you been at the University of New Mexico? Uh, this is my, just finished my sixth year. Your sixth year. And is that where you went straight out of grad school? Yes. Okay. Very cool. So we were actually wondering if you had any tips for grad students that you might like to talk about. Tips for grad students. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that just kind of like pops in your mind and you're like, man, I wish I had known that whenever I was a graduate student. <laughs> we have a, a class where a professor meets with the new grad students each mm -hmm. week and gives give advice. I'm trying to think of some of the advice I give. I think one of them is life balance. You know, there's a there's a tendency to, to go, 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 mm -hmm. go, but there's also like a declining quality of work with that. Uh, so it's important to create some time just to decompress and get away from the work. The second thing I'd recommend is, you know, getting involved in a lot of collaborative projects from the get-go with mm -hmm. different uh, different professors on in the in various departments. So, so do you diversifying your stocks and bonds? Ah, I like it. <laughs> That's awesome. I've actually heard some people say that collaborating like with different people and doing a lot of research in sort of different areas is actually not the best idea. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on that? Like, do you think that it doesn't it doesn't really matter that much? Or do you think that it is important to kind of like maybe have different people, but have like kind of a similar research area focus. that you're looking at? Well, that that's a good sense. question. I would say it, it worked for me, uh, and a part of it was just it was it allowed me to uh, deeply explore different subject areas by work by working with different people um, and get different forms of mentoring from individuals. Yes. So I would I would think that it would be good to keep keep general areas the same. So if a person has an in interest in race ethnicity, for, in for for instance, it worked for me to study race ethnicity differences in crime, and then race, ethnicity differences in sentencing. Mm -hmm. But to have kind of two different fields, I think, uh, not just for collaborative purposes, but just for uh, being able to, to kind of refresh yourself by going to, to, to one area when you get tired of the other area. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good idea, too. <laughs> okay. Do you want to bring in our favorite part of the show? Yes. Yeah, so our favorite part of the show, which is always at the very end, is where we ask our guests to bust a myth either in their area or kind of in criminology in general. So do you have a myth that you would like to bust today? Okay, so this <laughs> myth relates to uh, the, the relationship between academia and policymakers. Oh, so, thank good. you. Love. A, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of perception. Of, I had this perception for a while that policymakers really are annoyed by academics and don't want, don't want them, uh, they want to keep it separate. Mm-hmm. In some instances, so not only that they're not uh, caring about what academics find or study, but that they don't want their help. They uh, were a nuisance. Sure. Um, so since I've been, I worked at the Sentencing Commission and a lot of ease of access there when I was at Penn State. And now I'm at the University of New Mexico and I'm working with the Sentencing Commission here. And I'm actually working with some of the courts around here to change sentencing policy. Mm -hmm. So I guess the myth would be that there is this fracture between academia and policymakers. There, there is, but there is a big willingness among policymakers these days, specifically among a lot of court actors, mm -hmm. to engage the research community in ways that can improve their system. And 
So, for instance, I work with the one of the courts around here, and they're interested in reducing racial disparity, disproportionate minority contact among juveniles. Oh, well, fantastic. That, that's a big that's a, a it's a big thing for them to even admit that there's a problem, yeah. and then to be willing to reach out to, to try to fix it. Wow. Absolutely. That's, That's great. Fantastic thank bit. you. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much. And that is our episode. Thank you so much for being here. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you for providing the opportunity. Thank you so yeah. much. And we'll see you at ASC. All right. Take care. Have a good Bye. one. Thank you.